Hello, I'm Ed Gallagher, President of the American Scandinavian Foundation and Scandinavia House. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this program on ScandinaviaHouse.org, focusing on the current virtual exhibition, Conversations with a Shipwreck, and featuring the artists who created that exhibition, Joan Wickersham and Adam Davies, in conversation with Dr. Fred Hawker, the Director of Research at the Vasa Museum. Thanks to the support of an ASF grant, Joan and Adam spent a full month in Stockholm at the Vasa Museum, working closely with Dr. Hawker and his team as they created the work included in the exhibition. In their pre-recorded discussion, Dr. Hawker and the artists will discuss the exhibition and its evolution. Following this, they will join us for a live Q&A. So please send us in your questions or comments using the chat function on your screen. The full event will be available later to stream at ScandinaviaHouse.org. A special thanks to Lars Bjorkman, Dr. Hawker, and the entire team at the Vasa Museum for the assistance they provided in organizing the exhibition in this program. I hope you'll enjoy the program. Thank you. One of the most popular questions here at the museum is, how did we get the ship into the museum? Basically, how do you get the ship in the bottle? Uh, a lot of people think that the museum was built over the ship. That was an option. Uh, but in fact, they took advantage of existing construction uh, of a dry dock a facility built to take ships out of the water so you could do maintenance on them. And in fact, Vasa in its life, uh, in its modern life, has uh, had close relationships with two different dry docks. Uh, the vessel sank right in front of uh, one of the largest ones in Stockholm, the Gustav V dry dock built in the 1920s on the island of Beckholmen. And after the ship was raised and refloated, it was taken into that dry dock in order to get it onto the concrete pontoon that it sits on today. But then the question became, and, the, and the, re well, the reason for that was so that they could move the ship around the harbor they needed to, because eventually it would have to go to a permanent museum. And the question is, how do you get the ship into the museum? And because the Navy had a disused dry dock built in the 19th century uh, that they was no longer suitable for the modern generation of ships, it was possible to take that dry dock and build a museum over it. Uh, we're standing now essentially inside a big hole in the ground. Uh, and it's possible to flood and drain that in order to bring a ship in, set it on blocks, and then drain the water away. And that's exactly what was done in December of 1988. The building here was built starting in 1987 over the dry dock and then leaving the wall at the stern of the ship open. Uh, and you can still see there are bits of the original dry dock wall here on the right, the, the big uh, rustic stonework. And so the ship was encased in a protective cover and then moved on its pontoon, pontoon into the dry dock through the open wall at the end of the building. Uh, and then after the ship had been positioned ex very carefully on some concrete pilings that had been made in the bottom of the dock, the dock was closed and the water was carefully drained and the pontoon guided so it came to rest on top of this forest of uh, concrete pillars in the bottom of the dry dock. Um, that's where our climate system is today, so it's still possible to go down and wander among the, the pillars. Uh, and so once the ship was in place, it was possible then to build the, the final wall of the museum uh, so that uh, they could close it in. And you can't tell today that that's how it was done. But in fact, that back wall of the museum behind the stern of the ship is a fairly light construction that's not load-bearing at all. It's really the door to let us get the, sh the ship in the museum. Could we get the ship out of the museum again? Well, theoretically, yes. But after the ship was moved in, the pontoon it sits on was very heavily modified to make it into our primary storage area. That's where the magazines are. It's where the wine cellar for the restaurant is. It's where we store the spare furniture. There's a laundry facility down there. Uh, and so we would have to completely rebuild the pontoon so it could float again. But the dry dock is, in theory, still functional. 
We still flood the forward end of it uh, every uh, summer in, in front of the entrance to the museum and set up a fountain there. Right now it's dry, uh, as you saw at the beginning of this little vignette, and you can see the carpet of stones in the bottom of it. Uh, those are in fact the ballast stones that were found in Vasa, uh, which have to be stored somewhere, uh, and that's a, a convenient spot for them. So there's 120 tons of granite ballast in the, from the bottom of the ship that's now lining the bottom of the old dry dock. So why did Vasa sink? That's always one of the frequent questions we get from visitors. How could a ship built so, such a large an investment, the top technology of the day, the best designers of the day, why did it only last for about 1,200, 1,300 meters? What was wrong with the ship? Had somebody done something wrong? And ultimately, that is really the question people are uh, curious about. It's not what happened, it's whose fault was it? That's what we really want to know. Well, there are several different ways to look at that and to answer it. Uh, one of the approaches we've taken here is very similar to what a modern accident investigation board, like the National Transportation Safety Board in the US would do with this kind of an accident, such as an air crash or a, a collision at sea. And that is to look at every possible aspect of it to what created the conditions that made the accident possible, as well as what they call now today the, the accident chain or the error chain. Very rarely is it one thing that causes an accident. It's a series of errors that grow in magnitude until something seriously bad happens. And so we actually have to look at several factors. A fundamental problem is that the ship was not stable. It was not seaworthy. And so that's a very, that's a very technical issue. Why was the ship unstable? In other words, it took very, very little wind in the sails to heel the ship over far enough that water began to run in through the gun ports. Uh, this, we're in, a, in about this part of the ship, one deck lower is where the water started to come in. And that's normal. Water does come in the gun ports uh, on these kinds of ships, and they should be designed so they can deal with that. They'll right themselves, and then the water will run out again through what are called scuppers. You can see one under this gun port. There's a little round hole in the side. That's just a drain so that water can run back out again. But the ship has to right itself. It has to have enough stability so that it can get itself back upright and get the gun ports out of the water. But Vasa didn't have that kind of stability. It was way too tender, uh, as, they, as it was said. In fact, it was so tender it would be called crank which means that it went basically heeled over and stayed there. So water simply continued to pour into the ship. And the problem is that the center of gravity of the ship is too high. It means it takes very little energy to heel the ship over uh, and keep it there. Why is, it, why is the center of gravity too high? A lot of people thought it might be the cannon. You know, there are 24 bronze cannon on this deck and another 24 on the deck below. And the total weight of all of those guns is 62 tons of bronze above the waterline. In fact, that's not actually a big problem. Uh, we know from uh, this, the histories of lots of other ships that successful ships of this type often had the armament at about 5 to 7 percent of the total weight of the ship. And in Voss's case, it's right around 5 percent. The problem is not the guns, it's the decks they stand on. The decks in the ship are very heavily built much more heavily built than they need to be, and they're too tall. They set those guns too high above the waterline. I'm standing underneath one of the deck beams on the ship, and you can see I have plenty of headroom. I'm five foot 11, a, a meter 80. I'm almost six inches taller than the average Vasa sailor, who was about five foot five and a half. And so if, if you think about people this tall, walking around in here, they have way more headroom than they really need. And so this deck is much higher than it needs to be. That means everything that's standing on this deck is higher than it needs to be. The deck I'm standing on is probably about eight inches too tall, it, that it, you know, much more than it needs to be. That raises everything, increases the weight of the ship structure, and then the beams themselves are m heavily built. They're heavier than they need to be, and so there's too much weight high up in the ship. 
That's why the ship's unstable. Now there's a whole bunch of other factors that are why it sank, that are human factors, because people knew the ship was unstable, unstable and they sailed it anyway. Preserving the ship for the future has been a challenge since the, before the ship reached the surface. There was a lot of thinking, a lot of experimentation before the ship was raised to try to determine what the best method for preserving it for the long haul was. Uh, and at that point, they didn't really know how long it was possible to preserve it. We tend to think in a fairly open terms about that. We now think it should be possible to preserve the ship for a thousand years. And if you think about it, we're already 6% of the way there. Uh, it's been 60 years since the ship was raised. But there were several problems that had to be solved in the preservation. Uh, one of the most uh, pressing was what to do about the waterlogged wood. Uh, as the wood sat underwater, parts of the structural material in the wood cells dissolved away and the cells filled with water. You simply remove the water, atmospheric pressure will crush the cells and the, the wood will collapse. And so you have to replace the water with something that will also be rigid once the, you dry it. And so the material they settled on was something called polyethylene glycol, which is essentially a water-soluble synthetic wax. Nowadays, it's mostly used as a food and cosmetics additive. It's odorless, tasteless, colorless, non-toxic. Um, but it had originally been developed for the forest products industry to, as a way to stabilize green wood. And so the ship was sprayed for 17 years with that material to let it soak into the timbers, uh, and then it was gradually dried over another 10 years uh, to try to provide some stability. Here on the inside of the ship, uh, there was not much effort made afterwards to, to clean up from that process as it was on the outside, simply because it wasn't expected that this would be seen. And so all these big white drips that you can see on the timber are, that's the conservation chemical, the excess that's been running down uh, while it was being sprayed between 1962 and 1979. And, and its job was to prevent shrinkage. It's reduced the shrinkage, but if you look down at the deck, you can see that there are gaps between the deck planks. And that's a, the no normal sort of shrinkage that we see, about 6 or 8 percent across the grain of the timber. If the timber hadn't been sprayed, that could be 12, 20 percent, uh, and that would destroy the timbers. So that part worked very well. A second uh, task was to reattach the timbers to each other. All of the iron fastenings that had been part of the original structure had corroded away completely. They had to be replaced with something. And so the original holes were filled with new bolts and where there had been nails, uh, screws. The screws were in stainless steel. Uh, the bolts, were they used mild steel because the expense of stainless steel would have been too much in the 1960s. Recently, we've had a project to replace those bolts from the 1960s with proper stainless steel. You can see those here. These are the new bolts that have gone into the original bolt holes uh, made in a high grade of stainless steel that was originally developed for deep ocean drilling rod. Uh, and then you can also see occasionally there are screws in places. And we sometimes have to add a little bit of extra uh, material in order to stabilize certain timbers. This particular timber is, is cracked, and so these are effectively clamps holding it together. But by and large, the ship supports itself as the wooden structure it was designed to be. In the long term, that's not a good idea either. And so we're currently in the process of designing an entirely new support structure for the ship that will be a series of elements underneath the ship, but also uh, a framework inside the ship that will help lift the weight of the deck beams off of the sides, and so we can support them independently and provide a comprehensive support system that is matched very closely to how the ship's weight is trying to distribute itself. We believe with those measures it should be possible for the ship to last hundreds of years. So first of all, just to explain, Joan brought me into the project. 
uh, we'd been teaching together and she presented her work and I presented mine and she had an idea of us maybe collaborating and me providing pictures towards some of the pieces that she wrote. And I'd never come across someone who was doing exactly what Joan was doing, which was looking at one object and really trying to describe it in language in the present, in the past, at different times. And I thought that that was really exciting and a really interesting way of thinking about a thing, a, a, a structure. I had first visited the Vasa Museum in the spring of 2013 and become really captivated by the ship and had been writing about it really ever since then. I'd been reading all the history I could get my hands on, including Fred, your book. And I also had come back to Stockholm again and again to visit the ship. And I've been trying to think about what, what it was about the ship that fascinated me right from that first glimpse. Your first view of the ship is as if it is a newly built ship tied up at the wharf. So it, so it feels very present. You feel very present in the 17th century. At the same time, because the museum is so gloomy and dark, you feel as if you're looking at the shipwreck on the seabed. And you also feel like you're looking in the 21st century at this beautifully preserved museum object. So I think there was something very interesting about that the ship is present, but it's also somehow embodying its own past, its own history. And it's as if the ship is the ghost of itself. Ordinarily, when you go to a museum and you see a room full of objects from a certain century, they've been assembled very deliberately to teach you something about the century, but it's, it's a kind of artificial collection of objects that's been put together. And this was just an accidental collection of objects that happened to be on the ship when it went down. So I felt that it was, I think the human uh, element of these tiny little, you know, keys and coins and shoes and hats and just the stuff that we all have on us every day, all the time, we don't even think about it, but that just happened to be what was there and it was all preserved. So I, I never had the experience. I don't think there is another place where you can have the experience of encountering a frozen moment of time from the 17th century. Then the, the interplay between the ship as a failure and the ship as a success. It, in its time, it was an embarrassment, but if it hadn't had that flop, it would not have survived intact on the sheltered, relatively sheltered location of the harbor floor of Stockholm to be rediscovered and salvaged in the 1950s, 60s, and the decades after that. You know, we, I, we, we often say at the museum that Vasa was the most powerful warship in the world for about 45 minutes. That ambivalence between the failure of the ship in the 17th century and its success in the 20th and 21st centuries does lie at the heart of, our, of how, we, how we interpret it. I, I like to say that every warship has two identities, uh, two functions, a physical function and a metaphysical function. One, you know, the physical function is to be a gun platform or a floating airport. The metaphysical function is to be a visible symbol of the owner's self-image ambition policy. Uh, and so we would say that Vasa is a complete and utter failure on the one hand as the, met as the physical worship, but as the metaphysical worship, it's seen and admired by pre-corona days over a million people every year who hear about the story of the King Gustav Adolf as his ambitions for Sweden. So we would have to say as the metaphysical worship, it succeeded far beyond anything uh, that its owner or builder could ever have imagined. I mean, first of all, it's just a beautiful object. <laughs> it's such an interesting, curious piece because, and, and it appeals to me so much because I love objects that wear their history on their skin. And you really see that with the Vasa. You, you, you see the layers of events all on its surface, both the, the craftsmanship of building it, the wear and the, the pressures of the water itself and being underground and the, or underwater, and then the salvaging, and then also the careful reconstruction, even the parts where pieces were missing and that were put back together and how it was put back together. And so it just seemed to lend itself so much to photography to really think about how to 
capture both the these different eras of time in in one image i thought that thought was really really exciting and as far as my own work i, I previously or while at the, when i was approached and when i was starting this i had been photographing bridges and tunnels a lot i was really interested in public infrastructure in the united states and it's i was thinking about this a lot recently and there are strange similarities between that and a boat in that uh, the way that I was thinking about a bridge and tunnel was that it was both an interior and an exterior space so that you can be underneath a bridge or inside of a tunnel, but it's also something that's connected to the outside world. And a boat in a certain way, even though I hadn't photographed boats before, or a ship, I should say, it really also has that internal external relationship to it. And these windows and these spaces that I felt like I could do something with that had a similar type of proportion to objects that had been photographing before, but it was an entirely new new thing so yeah it was just it was exciting to sort of jump aboard and try it and um, i was really really happy that i did well i mean the ship does have an architectural quality to it the the way that the decoration or the sculptures and everything else are conceived is very much in the tradition of a renaissance palace rather than anything anything specifically maritime uh, and the uh, the relationship between the exterior and the interior is in some cases very mannered. It's very deliberate in that sense. Um, and so that I can see where that would be an, an interesting idea to explore in photography or, as, or in writing. Also visually, it, uh, <laughs> the, the hardest thing in photographing that ship was also the, the sheen of the, of the surface. So dealing with, the, with lighting and trying to light that ship correctly for the type of image that I wanted to present. It was a very much a technical challenge, interesting one. Well, I, I, I can tell you that every photographer who's come into the museum to take pictures of the ship says exactly the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a shiny black object in a dark room. How on earth do you take pictures of that? Yeah. And, and, and we, when we're doing documentary photography, we're just used to the, to the idea that it's, the pictures are not going to look very good, <laughs> to be honest. So I'm, I'm just amazed at what you were able to extract from our, shiny black wood in a dark room. We came in May, I believe, for a month, and which happens to be the, pretty much one of the longest days and the brightest times in Stockholm. So we were able to work in the evening and there are a few windows in, in, in the museum space that let some light in. So some of the shots were able to, I was able to shoot using daylight, but just an extremely long exposure. Um, and if we tried to do that, you know, in the winter time, I don't think it would have been possible. So, so it was it was very fortunate that we were there that that month in particular. Well, the, those those long exposures are that's the thing. That's one of the things I remember so clearly about the whole project yeah. that it it, it was it, it, because we allowed you to photograph on board the ship, and the rules are the to do that, some, someone of us who works there has to be there with you. Um, but in this particular case, there's not anything for me to do except to, to be there to make sure that you're safe and the ship is safe. And it was an entirely different way for me to experience the ship. And I've been, I've spent a lot of time on the ship. I, I, there are other people who've spent more, but I, I'm, I'm up there. And I've shown something like 3000 people around on board the ship between state visits and uh, visiting scholars and that sort of thing. But I've never had an onboard experience like that. It was um, meditative or contemplative uh, to sit still because we couldn't move because it would shake the deck for these long exposures of 25 to 45 minutes for one image. And so uh, Joan and I ended up just lying on our backs on the deck to make as little as little vibration as possible, and eventually it, it, it becomes a kind of not not quite a trance state, but your breathing slows down, and we would talk very quietly about things and experience the ship in an entirely different way, see it at a at a level of detail. Um, that I think comes through in the images that I, that I can, I, I think maybe it's because I was there, but I think I can see in the images 
the amount of time it took to gather enough light for the image to reveal itself on the on the on the plate. So I I, I have extraordinarily fond memories of those those long days, you know, spending an entire afternoon to take three pictures. Um, yeah, I, um, likewise, um, and I hope that that's the case of this idea of the sort of accumulation. And the reason I do it is is partly the camera that I use. So I use an old fashioned uh, large format camera, which is the type that you get underneath a, a hood with. And it requires obviously being put onto a tripod. And then that type of camera needs more light anyway to, to make it a proper exposure. But then on top of that, I'm trying to get a lot of depth of field. So things are in focus from foreground to background. So that means that the aperture that I shoot with is extremely small. So very little light is coming into the camera at any one particular moment, which means that, like you said, the, uh, the, the shutter speed is extremely slow. So in fact, I think I even shot a few pictures that were about an hour and a half in, in, in duration, just one shot. What I found really kind of beautiful and strange and unexpected was I, I generally shoot by myself, but then if I have someone helping me, then there's normally just one person helping me and they're just, they're there and you sort of interact with them, but you have, I have to focus on taking the picture. So it's just sort of this awkwardness. But because there was Joan accompanied us as well as, as yourself, Fred, there were the two of you and you had your own conversations, your own world. And it was, I felt like I was just eavesdropping in into this world on and off as I was making the picture. And there was something really kind of beautiful and generative about hearing Joan and Joan, please talk more about this because I think it's really interesting, but sort of asking certain questions and drawing the eye to certain things. And then it would lead me to think about a new picture while I was taking this picture because it's such a slow process. I think one of the th nice things about that is that you spend a lot of time looking at the same thing. So you start to really look at, notice the details a lot more. It's, it, it slows you down. Um, yeah, I think there was really a kind of symbiotic thing that happened. And Fred, it's interesting that you talk about those days on the deck and below the deck, because I also remember those as really lovely and contempt, re very relaxed, you know, that you could just let the thoughts come to you. And then I could ask you questions about things I had read and hadn't understood. And you and Adam were talking about cameras. And I don't know if this is a, a specific thing, Adam, that is, that is true for you. But one of the photographs that I love is that photograph of the knight's heads at the, at the, near the, um, the bow of the ship. And I remember Fred asking you about those because in some of the early, the photographs from the April 1961, the day when the, the lift was completed, the, the journalist photographs, you can see those heads coming up just all by themselves. And I ended up writing a piece that talked about that. And then Adam was taking a photograph of that, but Adam, I don't think you and I specifically discussed that. It's just that we were both led to, to, to that focal point, I think, in that day, having the conversations and just lying there. Yeah, there well, there, there are seven of those heads on, on the ship. Uh, and uh, they're, almost all the sculptures are on the outside of the ship. There's very little on the inside. But those seven heads are the, are the sculptures that are visible on the, on the deck if you were a crew member. And so there are a very rare human element, a human embodiment uh, that you find amid all this, what is mostly otherwise a very technical, functional space. And so I think for that reason, they, they draw your eye. They're, they're curved, complicated forms in a world of planes and straight lines and, uh, and, and very hard, brutal, functional kinds of shapes. So I think they, they draw the eye for that reason, plus that they're people. And, and even, especially the ones that you're talking about, the, the, they're the, the uh, topsail sheet bits, technically, um, they were still standing. And so they'd been very badly eroded. Uh, and so they're, they're just barely visible, very, barely recognizable as, as people. But I, I find them very spooky and, and ghostly because of that. 
that uh, they, they seem to be staring with these huge vacant eyes because the, so much of the face is eroded away. Whereas the others that were that detached themselves and fell down in the mud, they still look very much the, the way they looked 400 years ago. They're you know, typical 17th century sculptures of people. They're, I find them in some ways less less compelling. I think that was the first time I had touched the ship, you know, um, physically. And I just remember, but I was at the very front of the ship and setting up a tripod there. And I just, you have a sudden flash of what it might, must be like to be standing on that ship, you know, when it was launched or, 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 or even as a carpenter building the ship and just standing at the very front looking out and, um, that was the first time I had to this, these sorts of. It really clicked for me that that there was some sort of relationship between the past and the present that was very physical through 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 the through the material of the wood. Before it was more a concept, but then it just it just felt it felt very very real and in the moment, and it's hard to explain. I wonder do. Is this, is this a shared thing for, for you, Fred, or for, for Joan? For me, it, it, was, it went from the idea to just being physical, I suppose. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll let Joan answer first. The object in the museum that does that for me, there's a, a, a display in a little case of a lantern that was lit when the ship, when the ship capsized, and you can see the museum has set up this little mirror so you can actually see the scorch mark that was made in the lantern when the lantern tipped over as the ship capsized and the flame burned the inside of the lantern. And I think there's something about that that felt very, it made the whole thing very real to me as a moment, as a moment in time where there were people on the ship going through this sudden emergency. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> people often ask me that because I'm in the museum, well, pre-corona in the museum every day, very often on board the ship. I have spent at, in, on occasion weeks at a time working all day in the ship. You know, does it ever get boring? And, and, and no, it's, I, I, this, the hair still stands up on the back of my neck when I go in the hall with the ship. I, I, there's always something new to learn. But I think the thing that's given me the the biggest rush of, of, it, of it all becoming very real um, was recently when we were inventorying uh, the collection of leather finds. So not the ship at all, but down in the, in the basement in the magazines, going through all the shoes and belts and gloves and mittens and purses and that sort of thing. And we have a whole bunch of mittens very simple, fairly crudely made. It's a single piece of leather folded over the hand with a cutout for the thumb and a separate thumb so, sewn on. But we found one that was a right hand, there, that's in rights. And the right hand in this part of the mitten that doesn't have fingers um, had a double row of stitching sewing the back to the front right here, right where, right where your ring finger would be. And it, would, it, took, it took me a minute of looking at that to, think, to try to figure out what was going on. But I did eventually figure it out that this was a mitten that belonged to some guy who had lost his ring finger. It had been amputated or pinched off or crushed or I don't know what. Um, but then his, the three fingers just don't occupy enough space in the mitten to keep it firmly on your hand. Your hand would slop around inside. So he took the expedient of just sewing the front and back together where that missing finger was. And so then he had kind of a lobster mitt, but it would keep the glove, it would keep the mitten on his hand. And that, that was such a powerful connection to one person's experience, to one person's suffering of one of life's little tragedies and just moving on with it and you know, finding a solution to the problem and, and getting on with it. it. It made a really powerful impression on me of, of made the people who were on the ship very real to me um, in that moment. I feel that, that those little moments are what, Joan, you really picked up on all, all the way along this project. And one of the things that 
again, made this sort of a really special project for me was being able to accompany you and watch how you worked and sort of watch how you would go behind the scenes and talk to, to Fred and to, to other staff at the museum. And you asked very interesting small questions that opened up and became something else. That was a wonderful experience. You know, after so many years of coming to the museum as a visitor with a notebook, to be invited behind the scenes was a really amazing experience. And I, I really got the sense, Fred, of how many of the people who work in the museum have been there like you for a really long time and really are very generous with their knowledge of the, of the ship. So I felt like I learned a lot from just talking to people about the objects and about the ship and about the history. And, but then also to see people in their daily lives, you know, curators that had to go and pick up their son at a school sports event or somebody who was getting ready for a birthday party that weekend or the month we were there in October, they were actually cleaning the ship during the weekends. And so we would hear from people about what they had done over the weekend cleaning the ship. And it was just, it just sort of made me feel like there's still a crew working on Vasa. You know, there's still, there's still, there's still this, this active community of people involved with the ship. And that was, that was amazing. And then the other behind the scenes thing that was wonderful for both of us, I think, was there's a hydraulic lift that runs up the back of the stern um, that the ship's carpenter uses and the, the curators use when they're cleaning the ship. And we, Adam and I got to go up on that hydraulic lift uh, for a series of evenings. Adam was shooting photographs with these long 40 minute exposures and Adam and I and the ship's carpenter were up on that lift within inches of those beautiful sculptures on the stern. And that was a revelation, you know, to see those sculptures and to see the detail, you know, that the eyes have pupils and the the knights are wearing belts and the belts have belt loops and belt buckles and they're the fingers of the figures have fingernails. And you just think about the carvers doing that work that no one, if the ship had had its expected life, no one would have really seen that work up close ever. But another thing that's important for us is uh, interacting with people who are new to the ship. And that was a big part of the pleasure I got out of this project was having the chance to to interact not for a 10 minute tour, um, but for but a more extended period with, with the two of you as you came to know the ship and develop your own relationship with it. And, uh, and I mostly was on board for photography and I'm a, I'm a technical nerd. And so I was fascinated by what Adam was uh, going through, not how he was composing the shots. I don't know anything about that, but you know, exactly what settings, what kind of camera, that sort of thing. And, and so I, was, I watched him very carefully and, and I could see the process that he was going through kind of in his body language as, you know, as I could see Adam, as you became more comfortable with moving around the ship, you became more familiar with the environment. Uh, you started to uh, be a little bit more adventurous in the kinds of photographs that you wanted to take. And you'd ask about, can we do this or that? And, and so I got a, I got a sense of your process at least in its, its technical guys but 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 Joan I one of the things I'm really curious about is is how your process worked well I think I had a sense when I when I would be in the museum think things would jump out at me and I would know that I wanted to write about that particular thing so I would just make notes of every physical element of that that I could uh notice while I was there. And I would take photographs of, of the object or the, the space or whatever it was so that I would, could take it all home and use those things as prompts. And so that's, that's really what I would do. The, the, sometimes I think um, you see something and you don't know what, what you might do with it. So for example, for me, that one of the most moving things in the whole museum is there's, there's a, a sail it, and it, the label says the smallest of Vasa's sails and it's behind glass and it's, it was found in a locker. Um, Fred, you would probably know exactly which sail it is. The four top gallant sail. <laughs> um, but I, it's just beautiful. The, the, you know, it's just this sort of shredded 
shredded object, but it's been laid out behind that glass so that you can see the full size of it. And it's the smallest sail, but it's still huge. And the fibers just glitter in the light. And I just found that very moving that it had survived, you know, that piece of cloth that size had survived and also that it had been pieced back together so, so meticulously by the, the restorers. And I knew I wanted to write about it, but I didn't know what I wanted to write. So I just spent a lot of time just thinking about that. And then just suddenly one day, you know, one day in the summer in Massachusetts, I knew what I wanted to do with it, but I, I, I couldn't, couldn't figure it out for the longest time. But it really was a feeling of hearing voices almost, if that doesn't sound too, too loony. But, but trying to keep everything grounded in really specific information and to not necessarily document things, not be too wedded to the historical uh, need to document because the objects are already beautifully documented, but also not to do anything that was really a travesty. Not to, not to misuse um, mm. a, a, an actual physical thing. Fred, you know, I was actually curious, what is it like as someone who is such a scholar of history and of the ship, what's it like to let people in who are going to come at it from a different, a different way of looking at it? Um, it's fun. <laughs> at, at, you know, at, at its most basic level, it's fun. Um, I, I'm fascinated by how people think and how they make decisions and how they view the world. Um, and I, and I, you know, I have a very clear idea of how I think about the ship and its history. And, and I have my own research interests and the kinds of questions I want to answer, but I'm in this, I am endlessly fascinated by how other people come to grips with this, this unique object, this bizarre survival of a 17th century environment. Um, and so the, that part of it, of, of watching their relationship develop is, uh, is, the, is a big part of the fun for me. The, uh, and, but most of the time I don't get to, I don't get to experience that in a really intimate or deep fashion. I get, I get to see their first impressions, but to work with the two of you and have those long moments and to watch your individual relationships developing um, was enormously satisfying uh, and, and fascinating. And now that you've told me a little bit about your writing process and how grounded it is in the physicality of the remains, in, in the close observation of the physical detail of the parts that survive, that, make, that makes a lot of sense with how I experienced you experiencing the ship. I, I, would, just, I would just say uh, um, as a final thought, and speaking as someone, as someone who is not usually ascribed I mean, much artistic sensibility, uh, I enjoyed this project more than a lot of the other things I've done in the 18 years I've been at the Boston Museum. It, it was so completely different, and we took a big risk because it, you know, this was not something we'd ever done before. But almost everybody who got involved in this, Ova, who took you up and down in the lift, and other people who took you down underneath the pontoon, or or work with you over in the dry docker. Everybody who got involved in this project got interested in it. Partly because it was a very different way of, for us to reach an audience um, to, to tell the Vasa story in a new way. And, we, and so all of us at the museum really appreciate the opportunity that your, that your ideas created for us. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, I can't express how much we appreciated your generosity and your time when we visited and also just the staff of the Vasa as well. Um, it, was an, it was a, we were hoping for a really positive experience and what we had was even way more than that. Um, and it was through your eyes also that we started to re-see or see in a different way the ship itself. And that was incredibly um, exciting, enlightening for us. 
So, so thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, I echo that, Fred. We were, we were just sort of hoping to get permission to, to photograph, and we didn't know that, the, that all these doors and drawers and rooms would be open to us, and then all these people would share their knowledge with us. So it was just a, it was really a, an amazing, amazing experience. Well, we, we, should, we should thank Lisa Monson, who was the museum director at the time, um, she was the one who got the initial email and then, and, and, and bec- I think mostly because you're Americans, it got sent to me as the museum's official American uh, and, and said, what do you think about this? You look, look into these people and, and tell me if this might be a good idea or not. And, and, and like I said, because I, I knew someone who had read one of your books, Joan, um, I, I, I knew something about you, you as a writer and, 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 you know, we did the standard, oh, we can better, better Google these folks, um, see what they've done, and see the examples of their work and that kind of thing. But uh, she then asked me about it. I said, well, what did you find out about these people? And is this something for us? And I said, you know, I think it might be. And then once, once we had that first meeting and, and she was really captured by the idea and then said, well, you know, she told, basically told the museum, take these folks anywhere they want to go. But I, I still need to see, I want to see those photographs physically in huge format in a dark room and, and read all of your text. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that at some point. Yeah, I'm, we're not done with this project by any means. Uh, there's definitely an exhibition and a book coming out of this in, in some form. I'm, um, uh, with COVID, of course, things have gotten a little bit messed up with timing, but um, but this is yeah. This has been a, a, a really wonderful experience and something that I think has additional lives to come as well. So welcome everyone to our virtual in conversation today. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Emily Stoddart, and I'm the manager of exhibitions and community programs at Scandinavia House in New York. I will be moderating this Q&A discussion period, so please feel free to ask the panelists uh, any question by typing in the chat box. So first, I will start by asking my own question for Joan. Joan, many of your pieces include uh, personal memories and references. Where did that come from, and how did you balance those with the historical facts of Vasa's story? Um, Well, thanks, Emily, and also thank you to you and Scandinavia House for hosting this event together with the Lhasa Museum. Um, I think for me, the, um, when I first walked into the museum, the the personal associations just started to come very quickly because uh, it really is the museum of an accident. Uh, Fred, you used the word accident a number of times in the, in the, little vignette about why did Vasa sink? And it's when you're aware, when you're in the museum, you're so aware of that, the fact that this really is this accidental moment and that all of the objects in the museum are juxtaposed with each other almost accidentally because they just all happen to be on board at that moment. And so I think it has, the Vasa Museum I think has an immediacy that's different from other museums and that immediately makes you think about um, your own life. There's something very vivid and fresh and kind of contemporary about it. And and it sort of brought up in my mind all of the juxtapositions that we have in our lives every day that we don't think about unless something disastrous happens. So for example, I was thinking about um, my mother had um, become very suddenly paralyzed and had to leave her home and go go to a hospital and then a nursing home she never got back to her house so the objects that were in her house when that happened was just whatever happened to be there that day and um, I think that there's something about the Boston Museum that brings up that kind of those moments that we all have in our lives so I think it I think it jostled me in that way and then in terms of um, keeping it tied to the historical facts I think that really helps a writer. I think, I think to have a kind of um, carte blanche to be told, oh, you can write whatever you want about anything is actually the worst possible assignment. I think you just, you just sit there and you, you don't know where to go because the possibilities are so infinite. And I thought that for me, the, um, 
the specificity of the facts of the story and the uh, physical properties of the objects in the museum were so grounding in a way. They really anchored me. And then I felt like I could kind of shoot off in all kinds of weird directions because I had that grounding in the facts and the history. Thank you, Joan. Um, and so I will uh, also ask Adam a question as well. Um, Adam, you mentioned that you, you know, shot all the photographs using a large format camera, um, but why did you choose to work with that particular camera? Why do you choose to work in that, in that way? Um, I, uh, I generally use an eight by 10 large format camera, which is a type of camera that probably had its heyday in the mid century of the mid 20th century. And it was mainly used for architecture, photography, and it's a very large camera. So it's um, probably the size of a suitcase um, when you open it up. And the reason why I'm, I like that camera so much is that, um, first of all, it shoots on film. So um, the negative itself is eight inches by 10 inches, which is why it gets the name eight by 10 inch. And um, that has a specific color and a specific grain quality that I really like and I felt was very atmospheric and would really fit well with, with this project. Um, like we said before, this wasn't, I went in um, actively not wanting this to be a documentary uh, project. It, that The documentary photographs of the ship had already been done. So it had to be something else. It had to sort of be more evocative and play with the way, play hopefully visually the way that uh, Joan's writing sort of plays with language. I, I wanted to sort of echo that. Um, and then the camera itself is um, a fairly unusual. Large format cameras are, are nice in that they allow a lot more control than regular cameras and that the front where the lens is and the back where the film is are separate from each other. So you can move the lens in and tilt it in, in angles in relationship to the film or to, to the back that's, that's behind it. Um, and that lets you control composition and lets you control framing in ways that you just can't do in a normal camera. And especially with sort of the tight quarters or the interesting angles that the ship creates, I felt like that was a really nice, nice plate with the, to, with the, um, with the object itself. And um, also there is a, the, the camera creates be such a large negative, <clears throat> and that gives you a, uh, a an image with such a level, high level of detail that um, I also like this idea of this immersiveness that the, the, you could really go into the picture. And um, I think those were the main reasons why I chose the camera. It's also just a very slow process working with that type of camera, as um, as we spoke about. And I find that for me as an artist, I prefer going to a site and figuring it out on the site itself, figuring out the picture, figuring out the composition. Um, I'm not the type of photographer that takes a million photographs and then picks the amazing one out of a huge bunch. Um, I really have a lot of admiration for photographers that work that way. Um, but for me, I, I really like to get locked in on site and really feel what the site is like at that moment and make my photograph adjusting to, to those things on the fly. That, that to me is sort of how I work is a bit more like plein air painting or something like that. I actually have a question for Fred, um, which is something I've been wondering about, which is if the Vasa were discovered today, uh, what, would, what would be the approach? How, how would they approach the salvage and the preservation differently from how it was approached in the 50s and 60s? Oof. Well, <clears throat> that would depend on a couple of things. Uh, if we found a Vasa today, and we we have in the last ten years found a number of other well-preserved shipwrecks sitting upright and intact on the bottom of the Baltic, and they're still there, because now that we've raised one Vasa, we know what the long-term commitment afterward is. Nobody has the political will to do that ever again. Um, and I, I like to say that every country has one iconic shipwreck in them. Uh, that there's one wreck that somebody you might find that the country will devote its resources to, but after you've done it, it's, you know, then you're done. Um, but the way we might approach it today, because nowadays the, the theoretical perspective for mar maritime archeology span very much has to do with in situ preservation, we would probably today invest a large amount of resources in documenting the site as much as we could without actually touching it. And we would leave it in place 
find a way to protect it, uh, and we would uh, learn as much as we could without disturbing it. Uh, and then we wouldn't have the headache of trying to figure out how to preserve it for a thousand years. It deteriorates very slowly on the bottom. Um, I, I, I'll speak for myself. I, I'm, I'm from an earlier generation of archeologists uh, and people, people like me have no interest in that approach whatsoever. I would think that I, I would, you know, if, if that was what my job was like, I would go be a banker or a golf pro or something else. Um, I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't find that interesting because what I really enjoy about my work is being able to look at every side of an object to understand it as completely as possible. And I would feel so frustrated about only being able to see the outside of something um, that it, it, I, it would, I, I would grind my teeth in agony every night. Um, so I might not be the best person to ask. If we just talk about how we would approach it archeologically today, if we were going to do the same thing, if we decided we were going to raise that, that shipwreck, um, that I can answer. Uh, and then we would probably do a lot of the same things today that were done 60 years ago. Um, the method that was used technically for recovering Vasa the surface is a method that was developed 200 years before Vasa sank. There's a book about it from the 15th century, uh, talking about trying to raise one of uh, uh, a sunken Roman ship, for example. Um, and so it's a tried and true method. It works. It's pretty reliable. Uh, it does relatively little damage to the ship if you do take the right precautions. Um, I think we would probably still excavate the ship after we raised it to the surface rather than try to empty it on the bottom for a variety of reasons. The one thing that we would, things that we would do very differently today is that we have a lot more tools for documenting what we're doing while we're doing it. Instead of putting numbers in a notebook about where things were found, we would scan everything. And so we would have very detailed three-dimensional digital models of every phase of the project. So we'd never be in any doubt about where something was found. Um, We'd also have better conservation methods today that um, there were very fragile materials found in the 1960s that it was not possible to conserve then. And so we only know those objects from photographs. Uh, and nowadays we develop techniques that a lot of that material we would be able to save and conserve. Mm -hmm. And so we'd have a much richer record, both in terms of physical objects and in terms of the kind of data we'd recover. Um, then we can could there was then it was possible to extract in in 1961. This is such an interesting project that has so many different layers. Of course, um, there's also this fusion between two worlds, Fred, yours, and and the artist. And I feel like um, you know so much has happened since um, Joan and Adam visited you in Stockholm and produced this body of work. And for us, you know, um, I worked closely with Joan and Adam to develop a virtual. Um, uh, iteration of the exhibition, um, of course, during the pandemic. And I just wanted to ask all of you, um, you know, based on, on what's happened in the past year and a half, um, what is your, um, how do you see, you know, maybe for Joan and Adam, how do you see this project um, morphing or changing into a physical manifestation? Because the three of you do certainly have such a strong interest in physical objects and in terms of having a uh, environment or atmosphere in which to experience work and to explore these ideas. Does this experience, you know, going from virtual and then kind of re-emerging back into the physical, is that, is that changing your perspective on what you want the show to be uh, when it travels as a physical exhibition? Um, I can start with that, I think, but um, yeah, the, it, I mean, the pandemic has been uh, a really crazy time. It's been very interesting. I think we wouldn't have even considered a digital exhibition prior to it. Um, and we're so grateful also for Scandinavia House to approach us and ask us uh, to do this. Um, I, I think, you know, prior to this, we were very much thinking about physical objects. And I think one of the things that we're fairly proud of and we're happy with is how it we've adapted this to a, a sort of a di digital presentation. And 
that has uh, given us a lot of ideas in terms of going forward, in terms of playing with the recordings, playing with perhaps even different ways of lighting or projecting the images um, going forward. I, um, I think for everybody, the boundaries between digital and non-digital have gotten very blurred, which is interesting. And so um, I know personally, I'm interested in playing with that. Um, I, I still shoot film, but then I print digitally. So I inherently mix this, those two languages. And um, I don't know, Joan, what, how about for you for writing? Um, has there been changes there as well? Well, you know, it's interesting because the, um, I, I, I feel the same way you do about the digital, you know, the digital, I don't think we would have explored the digital stuff without the, the enforced constraints of the past year. And I'm really glad that we did because I think um, everybody's been so alone at home and this now allows the, um, the work to kind of come in and for people to experience it privately, which is how we've all experienced so many things in the past year. I think for, for me in the writing, the, um, the book part of it that I'm working on is about between 50 and 60 of these pieces. I think there are 12 of them in this current exhibition. So um, there's actually a quite, quite a wide body of work here that I'm working with. And um, I think the past year has kind of confirmed for me the, um, the feeling that I have about Vasa, which is that it's a, um, it, it brings up, I think a lot about uh, permanence and impermanence and mortality um, and memory and loss. And for me, those were the, the themes that I guess I was working with the whole time. I'm never sure what the themes are until I'm long past finished with the, the work, but, um, but, but it just feels like, oh, those are, those are actually really current themes for a lot of people right now. And so it just, it just, I had, I had thought a lot, um, I had thought a lot about the 17th century idea of vanitas paintings where um, they used to paint um, a skull. And the idea was that the skull was a, a contemplative object that made you think about your own mortality. And that's also true of even things like Dutch still life, 17th century Dutch still lives where you know, the fruit is fresh in the picture, but there's a rotting piece of fruit in the corner, or there's a wilting tulip in among the, the fresh tulips. And I think there is something about um, just the somberness of, of the past year and the realization that we have. I think, I think for me anyway, you know, growing up in the 20th and 21st century, I have felt insulated from certain experiences that previous generations have had to go through collectively as generations. And I think there's a way that having been in this um, pandemic, which, you know, was such a, it's, it's such a frightening, um, you know, a, apocalyptic kind of feeling event. Um, to me, the, the I, I think it's just, for me, it's kind of cemented my, um, my sense that that the Vasa actually has something to tell us about all of that. Fred, I, I, I was yeah. I'd, I'd add something there that um, yes. because we closed like like all, lots of big public institutions, um, and frankly, economically, the pandemic brought the museum to its knees because we're completely funded by the entrance fees that people pay at the pay at the door. Um, and we 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 had to how do we how do we get our message out how do we how do we fulfill our mission as a museum if people aren't coming in the door? Um, and so I'm I'm going to recognize somebody who you're all seeing just as a name on the screen, Lars Björkman, uh, who is one of the marketing people at the museum, and is one of the wizards behind how we use digital media to still deliver the museum's mission. Um, and so our involvement in this particular exhibition fit very much into our attempt to still reach, reach the public. Um, Lars filmed a lot of vignettes similar to the ones that you saw at the beginning of this evening, this afternoon. Um, and even they, he, he was part of a group that came up with the idea that we would have a live broadcast every day from the museum at 428, 1628, the year the ship sank. Uh, PM, 
that would take you to something you wouldn't normally see if the museum weren't closed, which was a great success. And it really helped us hone our chops on how we can use this kind of media. And so when this exhibit came up at Scandinavia House, we were both mentally prepared for it and technically prepared for it, that, that we were able to think about how we might contribute to it. Uh, but also we were really excited about the possibility that it might offer in, in, in the world we found ourselves in, um, of how do, we, how do we make this big physical object present for people who can't step in the door and share the, share the space with it. Um, and because Joan's writing and Adam's photographs did such a great job of evoking that experience of, of putting you in the room with the ship, even digitally, you know, this was a really great opportunity for us. And we're, as a museum, we're really pleased with, with how it turned out. So, um, yeah, it's just been such a wild year for everybody. Um, and it's been amazing to see museums and artists um, finding new ways to uh, create visibility and to endure what's happened um, and to create new audiences. That's something at um, Scandinavia House we've also had to develop because we've shut down in New York um, since March. Um, and we are just starting to reopen our doors to the public. So this has all been a learning curve. Um, and I do think, I agree that um, this project and um, the, in its entirety has, is very um, timely and uh, there's a lot of space for reflection um, on a variety of levels. So um, Fred, I don't know um, if you have any additional questions for the artist just because this was such a new um, uh, adventure for you to be working with artists. And I mean, I also, I have lots of questions, but, you know, I would be curious to know if the museum would continue with perhaps like an artist in residence program or something like that, working more uh, closely with people who have this kind of uh, curiosity um, just to see what happens. Um, that uh, the, uh, I can say that um, as a result of this project, we're more, more open to these kinds of ideas. Somebody has to be the guinea pig. To, to see if it would work. Uh, and we were very fortunate that Adam and Joan made a great impression on everybody at the museum. And because it was such an interesting idea for a project. Um, that uh, so, uh, and we're now, uh, our, the director who green lighted the, the project is now, has now moved on and we're on to a, a new director, uh, Jenny Lind. Yeah, there really are Swedish women named Jenny Lind. <laughs> one of the, a current one is a director of the Voss Museum. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, and it was because she had heard so many good things about everybody's experience with this that she said, well, let's see what we can do to, to, to help Adam and Joan to make the exhibition part a reality um, and contribute to that. But let's also you know, think about, keep this in mind when other people come up with these ideas. The only other thing we've done so far that's close to this, and, and it actually was before June and Adam, was uh, we commissioned um, a piece of music from a visiting scholar in the Fulbright program who was a composer to uh, write a piece of music on the theme of 20th century people meeting a 17th century shipwreck, uh, which ended up being a very interesting experience. And perhaps partly because of that, we were willing to consider something uh, like what Joan and Adam proposed. But we have had inquiries about, would we consider an artist in residence? We've discussed that. Uh, we have had other people visit us as lecturers uh, to talk about projects that aren't strictly academic in, in the sense of historically focused, but have a more uh, artistic component. Um, and I will say that it's something we think about when we're opening uh, conventional exhibits is they become more of an event, a happening, you could call it, uh, where we want to involve artists in that process. Uh, we're currently talking about the, the, the last evening of an academic conference that we'll put on next year will be some sort of artistic happening 
um, that will be related to the subject of the conference, but won't be strictly academic in its, in its content. And one of the things that came up when we started um, talking about this and talking about the process of creating another exhibit was the exhibit producer said, well, well what if a component of this was really, really big photo, detail photographs of things from the collection? Uh, so clearly Adam's work has had an impact on the people at the museum. So you're, you know, the, 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 you know the, the best compliment in the world is plagiarism. Somebody's stolen your good idea and it's going to run with it. The, uh, um, <laughs> and, and so um, it, it, it's, it's opened the eyes of people at the museum to alter, alternate ways. And because it came, this, this, your, the exhibition part came along at the right moment, like I said, it's the right, it, you know, everything happened at the right moment with the right constellation of people coming together to make this work. And at the museum, we've been really lucky uh, over the years to have that happen to us. And, and maybe it means we're doing things right. Um, but in my 18 years, we've had, we've attracted lots of really interesting, talented people um, to do really interesting things. And I'm, I'm hoping and expecting that that's going to continue. I just wanted to say that um, I hope everyone visits the website for the exhibition, which is quite easy, converse, conversationswithashipwreck.com. Um, and that will be up running uh, through September 7th. Um, and of course, this program and some other um, additional programs will be available on the exhibition website along with uh, Scandinavia House's YouTube channel. Um, so I just wanted to say that now. Um, but does anyone have any other questions, Adam? Yep. It's not a question, but I just wanted to put a plug into um, uh, I, I want to put a plug into people who may have not visited the Boston Museum that once travel is resumed and the pandemic is over just to visit the museum. A large part of um, the inspiration and ideas that we got from it was from the museum itself. It's a, a museum unlike any other museum I'd ever been to. Um, and it uh, does a beautiful dot job telling the story, but it also has a structure and and the boat inside of it, the ship inside of it, both are uh, unique and really, um, really fascinating. So um, it's 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 a great it's a it's a great great museum. So it's it's there's a lot to to take from there, and I just recommend people to to go check it out. So it looks like we do have a question here coming up. So I'm just going to try to keep track of everything um, from Jonathan. Um, just saying how it's, uh, you know, what a great direction for the museum to relook at uh, their collection and through a contemporary voice and vision um, that, that it's fantastic to, you know, to reinvent uh, our perspectives that way. And just wondering how much uh, Joan and Adam um, discussed your work when you were working on it and exchanged ideas. And um, what, if so, how much um, did your work influence each other? Was it, um, did you feel the influence uh, by working together so intimately, so closely? You know, I, I felt like when I, um, you know, I had been working on it for about five years. So a lot of my work was written by the time I invited Adam in, although his, his presence and his work, watching him work inspired all kinds of new pieces as did being in the museum. But what I, what I felt was, we, we both admired each other's work really hugely before we got going, but it was very hard for me initially. I understood on principle that I did not want images that were gonna illustrate my pieces. And yet it was very hard for me to let go of that idea, um, even though I knew that's not what I wanted. So I would say to Adam, wouldn't that make an interesting picture? And what do you think about photographing that? And he would just sort of, sort of, and it was just, I just felt like against my knowledge, against my instincts, against my knowledge of him as an artist, I kept trying to push it toward illustration and he kept resisting. And that was the best thing for the project because it, 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 we both felt that we did not want to literally 
um, we didn't want to have pieces that corresponded uh, literally to each other's work. And finally, in one of these pre-planning phone calls, Adam said to me, let's just go to Stockholm and make a bunch of stuff and then we'll figure out later how to put it all together. And that was the best thing I thought because it, it was like um, we were both working in the same key of music. I think we both saw, Adam talked a lot about um, having a particular palette for his work, you know, that the work had a kind of, there was a unity um, not a sameness, but a unity. And I think I was also working in a palette. And I think he and I were working in similar palettes, but we had to trust each other and figure out, at, once we made the work, then we figured out how it fit together. Is, is that what you remember, Adam? Uh, yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> definitely. Uh, um, I hadn't worked so closely as a collaborator, in a collaboration before, so it was, a lot of just figuring it out, but I was really thrilled to how much in sync we, I think Joan and I are uh, just about the process of making work. I think we make very different things obviously, but the way that we approach it, the way that we both want a level of control or technical control, but also want to sort of allow the subconscious, allow like things to get messy, allow things to get a bit weird. Um, we had a similar sort of response to it. So it was really nice. I, I felt like I was learning a lot from how Joan, uh, how she talked about writing was actually a nice way to sort of think about making photographs because it wasn't anything, um, it wasn't a visual image. It was just an idea, it was a concept and then you can play with that and it felt very freeing. Um, I did feel a lot of responsibility, especially early on to being, to representing her work correctly. But I think we both, and. But I knew that, that it wouldn't be an illustration, but I just felt like it had to, I guess that's what I meant by the, the tone or the mood, that it had to fit the same type of mood that I was feeling in the writing. Um, and Stockholm itself is a really, um, it, it, was, it was really good to be there with her at the same time for that month because we experienced sort of the same, the same atmosphere and the same, the same sites together. And so that sort of riffing work, but Stockholm itself has a very distinct quality of light, has a distinct character. It has a distinct uh, aesthetic that I tried to put into the picture as well. So I was really thinking about color, about um, the busyness or the lack of busyness of the pictures, the um, sort of a rhythm when, um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 I, th I think almost musically when I'm trying to construct something. So um, that's as close as I can get to explaining it. I'll, I'll add that from the museum side, we, did, we talked about that very issue in advance and decided internally that we would never ask you the question, why do you want to do that? <laughs> and that whatever, wherever you wanted to go, whatever you wanted to take a, fi a picture of, okay, well, We'll figure out how to how to, how to do that because um, we didn't think it was our place to 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 try to push either one of you in a particular direction, suggest anything you should write about or suggest anything you should take pictures of, but simply oh that we we thought we'd get the best benefit out of it if, if we let you do what you wanted to do as much as possible. Well, that was extraordinary too because. When, when you're working on a project, you're really working in the dark and you don't really know what you're doing and you don't really know why you're doing it. So to be able to work within an institution, but with that kind of freedom of, of not having to explain anything or figure it out or account for it, um, just, just that level of trust I thought was really, um, was, was amazing because we didn't know, you know, at the point that we were working in the museum, we didn't fully know what we were doing and we needed to not know what we were doing. So it's nice that you asked us to, to figure it out. Well, we, we always gave you a, a, a minder uh, to make sure that you didn't get hurt and nothing got broken. And, and, and we've got enough experience in that role that we know what to look out for. So you know, I, I occasionally say to Adam, well, don't walk right there, or you can't put, you make, make sure there's not a point sticking in the deck at that spot or something like that. Um, and, but we try to anticipate that as much as possible rather than, if I remember when we went on board, we didn't start with a two hour soft safety briefing. It was as much as possible to let you experience it. 
And then it was just became our job to keep on, you know, to, to look out for your safety. That must have been an amazing experience just to have that access. I can't imagine um, how you both must have felt as artists exploring. Um, so anyway, I think um, if anyone else has a question, I think um, our chat's been working here, but um, I just want to thank all of you for, um, for joining us today, um, all of our attendees virtually, and of course to the panelists, also to Lars for all of his help. Um, and I just want to add that, um, of course, you will be able to access this program um, uh, online after, after today um, on Scandinavia House is YouTube channel, as well as on the exhibition um, website. Um, and um, I hope um, our attendees also uh, explore some of our other programs at ScandinaviaHouse.org, um, as well as on our YouTube, we have a variety of programs that we have been doing online uh, over the past year. Um, and we also are venturing into live programs uh, on June 24th, we'll have some Nordic jazz uh, in Manhattan. So if you're in the neighborhood, I hope you stop by. Um, and some other um, exciting programs coming up. So anyway, thank you so much to all of you. And um, if any last words from, from this wonderful team um, to say, to send us off. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. thank you very much. Great, thank you and, um, and take care and we'll, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you.